our choices to transform the world. And if we add together, it touches on the heart of leadership. In training sessions with executive and senior leaders, when we're discussing how leadership is distinct from management, we present a thought experiment called the clone analogy. The activity goes like this. Imagine that you were given a clone who looks just like you, thinks like you, and does your job exactly as you would. Goes to your meetings, answers your emails and calls, and chips away at your to-do list. Which, we explain, frees you up to just do leadership as you understand it. Over two decades in multiple countries, the answers are always the same. Some say they'd like to read or learn more, professional development. Some would like to explore externally. What are others doing? With whom could we partner or collaborate? What trends are evolving? Environmental scan. And some would take time to reflect. But by far the most common answer every session is, I'd spend my time with my people. Listening to my people. At the heart of leadership is people. Yes, there's strategy, operations, markets, data, environments, but at the heart is people. Similarly, whenever I'm asked at parties, a phenomenon I vaguely recall from pre-parenthood and Miskit, what advice I'd give to those in managerial roles who feel that they're, they're just not really connecting as they'd like with their teams, I give them the short version. How much do you know about your people outside of work? The names of their kids, the names of their pets, potentially the names of their plants, what they do on weekends, when's their birthday, what are their plans for the holidays? For results only people, this is inane chit chat, but for leadership, it's the foundation of everything. Because if you don't know, because you've never asked, then you're just the manager. And you've created an adversarial relationship, you versus them. And what do people do in an adversarial relationship? They either refuse, ignore, or leave. Or those who don't like conflict or can't afford to leave, spend their energy trying to avoid friction and getting in trouble. Worse, they devote their talents, intelligence, and creativity not to their work, but to beating the system. This is the mechanical pigeon that bobs up and down just frequently enough to avoid triggering the system inactivity alerts, as if keystrokes have ever been linked to meaningful productivity. We don't want adversarial. We know our people are important. The problem is we're overstretched. We're too busy. So we revert to managing to meet our targets for the wrong metrics. And although maximizing performance and recruiting, engaging, and retaining top talent are priorities for every organization, unless you've earned a foundation of trust of your people by listening with empathy and showing that you care and respect them by asking the right questions, you'll never be more than just the manager. At parties, I give people the short version. This is the long version. Oh, sorry five minutes left. Okay. This is the medium version. And it includes the other four questions that bad people leaders never ask themselves. Question two, what do your people love most about their work? What are they most passionate about? What are they best at? When are they most engaged? What gets in the way? What do they need to excel even more? To unleash the best their people have to offer. The leader's job is to create the conditions, resources, training, support, and culture for optimal performance. Three, what do your people love most about working here? Apparently, more than 80% of Harley owners, motorcycles, have a Harley Davidson tattoo. This is not a plug for tattoos or motorcycles. But the analogy illustrates transformational leadership. People buying into the brand so much that they attach it to their identity. Like Olympians, members of elite military units, cancer survivors. 
considering that most people could do their jobs somewhere else, what would it take for your people to take such pride in contributing to the purpose and vision of your organization that they would get the company logo tattooed on their body versus I work here. For example, right to play's vision is to create a healthy and safe world through the power of sport and play. Imagine a whole organization where every single staff member really believed on a regular basis, I am making a unique and meaningful contribution to creating a healthier and safer world versus I coach football or I answer the phone at reception. You may, but it could be so much more. Four, how automatically would your people respond to the following statement? I am trusted and supported to use my creativity to achieve excellence in my work. Notice this says nothing about when, where, how, or with whom people work, nor about checking for approval. The response is automatic when people feel that they are confident that they have the autonomy to meet their accountabilities in the ways that work best for them and the license to take calculated risks and to experiment to try to make things better. Leaders should cancel from their repertoires, that wouldn't work here, or we do it this way. Focusing on the process, programs, or products instead of the purpose, people, and potential is the quickest path to irrelevance. You know who's getting it right? Harmons is a neighborhood grocery store in the United States, and their vision is be remarkable. People will be disappointed shopping anywhere else. It's a grocery store. It's a grocery store. That doesn't say we have fresh produce, low prices, a good selection, though they likely do. Remarkable is not something you can quantify. You can't manage someone to be remarkable and you can't train someone to be remarkable because being remarkable requires extra. Creativity, passion, energy, compassion, and the human touch, the stuff of the heart. And brilliantly, Harmon's mission is to value our associates and exceed the customer's expectations. They put their people first because that's the only way they'll ever get to the second part and to achieving their vision. We don't hire CVs or skills or experience. We hire people. And if you want more from them than their technical skills alone and bare minimum commitment, you should offer maximum flexibility and support in how they contribute remarkably and collaboratively and unleash the best of themselves. Five, where are explicit examples that you are prioritizing diversity? In 2018, before the social awakening, the New York Times reported that there were more CEOs of Fortune 500 companies named Dave than all women put together and only this past year has the percentage of women CEOs surpassed 10%. Attacking systemic racism at the individual, team, and organizational levels is an urgent priority for basic social justice. It just also happens that diverse teams outperform homogenous ones. Given the overarching theme that people are at the heart of leadership, leaders should consider which people. Instead of asking themselves these five questions, bad people leaders spend their energy and time on the wrong metrics and on enforcing the system on managing. There's no heart, no soul, and no transformation in this scenario. And yet they can't understand why they aren't connecting as well as they like with their teams. So they ask me at parties. When we make the choice to get these questions right, however, the hallmarks of success in leadership, including transformation, follow. But if you never ask, you'll never know. Bad. And the only way to answer them is by engaging your people. And the only way they're going to tell you what you need is if you have earned their trust through listening with empathy, respect, 
and care. Thank you.